listeners, welcome back to the Lost in Postulation podcast. I am joined by it's not why, it's why, it's not what, it's what, it's Neil Fitzpatrick. Oh, wow, or should I say wow? I think I might need an explanation. This is probably the first Lovely. intro where I've been fully flummoxed after In the it. dark, huh? Yeah. Yes. Can well. you shed some light on this? Pronounce what? What? Pronounce why? Why? White. White. Yeah, yeah. Almost. Yeah. White? I do white. You do yeah. white. Yeah, there yeah, yeah. it is. So you, my friend, you oh, take no. the silent H, mm-hmm. you invert it with the W, yeah. and yeah, you yeah. give it a sound. White. You aspirate. Is this me personally, or do you mean my, my countrymen of Ireland? Well, both. Okay, okay, but okay. Sorry, actually, sorry. the whole British Isles, because yeah. then I did a bit of research, of course. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the Old English, it actually used to be that way there wasn't the this yeah there wow. wasn't this notion of the as an expert linguist that i am mm, you know mm, mm. this notion of the silent h after the w that's something that came so you guys kind of still linger with that apparently whereas the americans yeah, yeah. don't well i can tell you with certainty in school we were told wh is a w sound and oh, you, actually, you can you can hear oh, the, you the air yeah. coming into the microphone there and specifically not a w and it was it was taught that mm. way so i i didn't know any better basically it's only really after i left Ireland, probably, that people started pulling me up on it. Of course, there was a Family Guy clip as well you might have seen, you know, the, the mm-hmm. Cool Whip thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, uh, cool whip. Yeah, where yeah. Brian is like, say cool. Cool, say whip. Whip. And then <laughs> Stewie says, cool whip. Like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, I, I'm aware of it. I yeah. just never really thought about it. Jeez. Of all, I feel like my accent has many uh, chinks in the armor for people to attack, and that's certainly not the first one I would go for, mm. my old Irish accent, but still. Much appreciated. No, but it's same. nice. And of course, I came at it from a highly critical angle in the beginning. And then I did Somewhere. my research. And yeah. actually, it's true to form. That's good. There's nothing that. wrong about it. That's good. I, th- I feel like saying it was objectively wrong would be overkill. That would be overly harsh, I would say. Right. It is just an unusual quirk of the language. Right. But the Americans, which I include myself amongst in that mm. bubble, mm. would make fun of it because they wouldn't know otherwise. They would. Among many other things, they do love a funny <laughs> accent, if nothing else. Yes, yeah. they do. They do. But here we are once again. This is our 18th episode. Oh my God. I can scarcely believe it myself. We've spent a lot of hours together in the last uh, six months. Together, us too, but also together with our listeners. Absolutely. And listeners, they keep coming back. They keep growing. And for any of you that are new here, uh, you can also help us to grow the podcast by giving us a rating on the podcast app, clicking subscribe so you can ensure you keep getting the podcast sending us whatever you want to our email, lostimpostulation at gmail.com, or tweeting at us, way or Neil? Uh, That would be at impostulation on Twitter. And I have one more request I just came up with right now. It's It's a new initiative I'm calling Recruit a Postulator. And what it means is if you have found yourself becoming a postulator yourself, if you've been enjoying postulating along with us, maybe even sending in your postulations, mm. why not recruit someone who you think would be a promising postulator? So we're looking for hypos. We're not looking for any old postulator. We want you, the listener, to go out and find us the best postulators we can. Uh, we trust your opinion. We trust your judgment. We know you'll find the best ones for us. So please, listener, recruit a postulator today. I love that previously unaligned initiative that you brought up. I think it's fantastic. It it didn't exist 30 seconds ago, so don't worry. There's a reason it wasn't aligned uh, in advance. And and while you're at it, listeners... Like a while there. (laughs) You can... uh, We will feature these postulators directly on the podcast. We love to. I mean, it's been, for me, one of the highlights has been bringing them on, whether that's through audio clip, whether it's through the emails, the tweets, what have you. uh, We love to have them on. Yeah. And we've had entire episodes inspired by listener postulations. We plan to to keep doing so and just just building on it. Yes, sir. So here we are, Neil. You've come with a mundane postulation. Sure have. And this was one actually that, uh, as with much on this podcast, came up off air, offline, first and foremost. And we almost had to stop ourselves and say, wait, 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 wait. save it for the podcast. Because <laughs> this is like prime mundane opener topics. So we were out for dinner uh, very recently and we got into the topic of Google reviews. And specifically the star system on Google, where we have anything actually ranging from one from, and you, you do see places out there which have ones and twos and threes and more commonly the kind of four, 4.2, 4.3. And mm-hmm. then you do have some places out there with 4.7, 4.8. So some crazy high reviews and a lot of, a lot to talk about within this system. Right. So many angles to address this from, but I think the most interesting for me 
personally that I can use myself is the question of how do you specifically decide where to go based on Google reviews? Okay. So first things first, I think about four or five years ago is when I really got into the Google map Mm. and it's now my best friend. Yeah. And not so much on the direction side, Mm. but really on, on this side of things, on the reviews, on the stars, on everything. I'm at the point where whatever city I go to, I'm marking every single place I go to. When people ask me for recommendations, it's super easy. I just Mm. shoot that Mm. over. I'm able to, you know, go somewhere and look for the little green flag of the one to go and, and check that out. So big fan of it, just nice, in principle. Nice. Now, how do I approach it? Especially with restaurants, I look at, so when I click in, I look at two things. Of course, the stars, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And my threshold there, I'd say, is around anything 4.2 and above is very healthy, is something that I know has had a good track record from mm-hmm. my experience. And it's a safe bet where you also don't need to investigate or, or dig too much deep or ask anybody else about. 4 to 4.2 is still okay. Mm. Anything below a 4, there, there's a stigma yeah. in my head, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's on the stars. Then the other component you have to have is the volume of reviews mm-hmm. it's gotten, right? Mm-hmm. Because if it is a 4.8 or 4.9, but it just opened and it's got 10 reviews... Early traction could be good, but you're still taking a bit of a gamble, right? Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of the absolute number, probably what I look for is something that's had at least 100 reviews, right? Yeah, yeah. So... That's kind of how I how I approach it. Well, what about you? Solid, yeah, solid system. Like I've had huge success religiously following this and being qu- quite an extremist yeah. on the Google reviews, actually. So we're like you. When we go somewhere, 4.2 is the cutoff. I can say that I have never had a fantastic experience in a place that turned out to be below 4.2. Right. So I, I, I can't think of one example where I've gone to a 3.8 or a 3.9 and come away feeling, huh. Oh, Actually, that was mm. a that was a four point five. You know, like right. they really they really do earn their three point somethings. I mm. found. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there's one other thing to watch out for, which is the fake reviews. Now, yeah, with the four point eights, those four point nines, th- sometimes it, it is a little too good to be true. Uh, the best example I've seen was we were in. I think it was Madrid or Barcelona. Anyway, one of those cities where we were looking for a pub crawl to join. And you just search, you know, Madrid pub crawl and about 10 of them come up on Google. Okay, yeah. And all of them are like 4.9, 5.0, like 4.8 mm, with yeah. like 200 reviews, 300 reviews, okay. 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5 yeah. all the way down. But as you scroll them and as you actually move your way down the list, it's right. from John L with one review on Google, from Sarah M with mm, one re- review on yeah. Google, and yeah. instantly it becomes clear what's going on. So then my trick is, the one that I that has kind of gotten me around this, is mm. sort by worst, sort by lowest to highest review. Mm-hmm. And in this example that I'm talking about, we read an absolute cracker of a review for the pub crawl, which was from some guy who, re- who gave it one star, and his, the whole text Brutal. of his... The whole text of his review was, I tried the pub crawl and I didn't like any of it. Wow. And that was the whole review. So we kind of, yeah, powerful stuff. I love the simplicity. So from that moment, we were like, right, this is probably full of crap or full of fake reviews and probably not a good pub crawl. And we made our own pub crawl in the end. Uh, side note, that was great. But well, I think you can see that, you know, the system has a lot of value, but you do need to approach it with a bit of caution. Mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. And do you contribute? So do you star yourself every place you go to and write a little review? I almost never star and I almost never write reviews. The only exception <laughs> is a now deleted review so don't go looking for it but uh i was i went to a an irish bar in stockholm Orlando airport terminal five yeah which turned out to be the simply worst restaurant experience of my life or one of them at least just like from moment one it was terrible and my flight was delayed so i had like two hours to kill so i, I sat in the gate and spent probably like 45 minutes writing a real prosaic you know lengthy wordy <laughs> review like really getting into the descriptors uh all this kind of stuff it's now gone listener i deleted it because this is this is the big problem i have when i leave a bad review which i have sometimes done for mm. emotional reasons within a week or something i feel bad and i come back and say okay that like, maybe That's i don't want to sick you yeah and it's like i don't want to i don't want to take away this person's livelihood like yeah you don't want to crash their business yeah right? i'm i'm not going to to um frequent their business again but that doesn't mean nobody should you know like so yeah but it is a it's a dog eat dog world out there and i know all the restaurants are leaving each other bad reviews around the place so it's it's really uh yeah it's a tough game it's intense right? it's a dog eat dog personally 
I used to never give stars or comment. Then the more I used it, I felt like, you know, I can't really free ride on this. Hmm. But I found myself only really doing it when I was triggered by something really yeah, bad. Yeah. And then there I was also like, okay, but this isn't fair. This isn't how the, the system should work, right? Mm-hmm. So now I'm trying to hold myself accountable. Yeah. And uh, it's not so easy. What I what I do, because it's in my interest, is I'm always like flagging all the places to return to. I put the mm-hmm. little heart mm-hmm. on it, but that doesn't actually help the restaurateur. So I really no. need to kind of build that that muscle there exactly yeah but then again like if you go to a place that's clearly doing fine that's absolutely booming that's hard to get a table i wouldn't feel too bad if if i don't leave True. a review there because they're True. whether i do or don't like they're gonna be fine yeah. you know it's it's more like these little startup-y kind of places there was a, i went to one or two little food wagons in copenhagen before where they actively said we're like hey if you like it please do leave a review because we've got none right now mm-hmm. so a bit like this podcast actually listener if you would <laughs> wouldn't mind giving a review we would really appreciate <laughs> it we are still uh racking up those reviews and it really does help so uh yeah yeah amazing stuff do you have any different approach when you're looking at hotels instead of restaurants yeah. well, well, the one thing I don't like about Airbnb, which we've sometimes tried, is you can't sort by worst, right? That technique mm. I just talked about. On Airbnb itself. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So if yeah. you're looking at a, a thing which everything on Airbnb has 4.9 or whatever, so already you've got star inflation there. Mm-hmm. But then you have to really go down through the reviews. And I think there's a little bit of like awkwardness in Airbnb. People hold back a little bit. Like they say things like, mm, wasn't wasn't phenomenal, but definitely recommend our next, you know, like mm. it, it seems that people are like hiding something, you know, yeah, or holding okay. something back. So what we often do then is we go to booking or agoda depending on what part of the world it mm-hmm. seems like they kind of have different coverage and then also sort by worst but then you kind of get all sorts there because sometimes people are like uh, i got a massage in my room and the masseuse uh was uh a little too gentle one star you know yeah, and there's like, so much more that can go wrong yeah. in a hotel stay yeah. than in the two hours you're at a restaurant right? also that like that's- also i mean yeah it's true like and ultimately yeah, you, you're, you can have your holiday properly ruined by a bad hotel. Mm-hmm. Stuff getting stolen or like just a horrible room, un, unclean, like all these things. So it is important to get right. But recently we've been booking for our next holiday and I think you pretty much can't find any place anywhere that doesn't have a one star a many many one star reviews because yeah. there's just so many people traveling around. Yeah. You know? So it's a bit of a minefield and ultimately it's a game of chance. But you, yeah. can, help, you can help your odds, I think, by doing the old sort by worst. And on booking, I've gotten to the point where the 4.2 on Google for me on booking has basically become a nine yeah, because like yeah. I've had so many between eight and 8.8 where mm, mm. for sure the pictures didn't match up. So oh, yeah. one, I say never look at the pictures because they're, they're never yeah. really user uploaded actually on booking.com. It's actually the hotel putting them. Yep. Yep. I've been to a place in Malaga once where they had a picture of a pool uh, and then when we went down to the lobby, having just arrived, it was quite warm. Uh, how do we get to the pool? And they're like, oh, no, no, uh, it's the neighbor's pool. Oh. It was the neighbor's Jeez. pool, which wasn't even a hotel. That's they just cheeky. took a shot of it from above. That is very like, cheeky. And that's when then I end up having to be the bad guy and going mm, and giving mm. these guys, you know, a three out of 10 or whatever. Well, that is deserved in that case. That's unreal. The only other thing I noticed on booking just the last couple of days is watch out for when you're reading the reviews because they have no time frame whatsoever. They, they'll they be from like 09. I was looking at a review and one of the complaints was uh, there was no iPod dock in this <laughs> in this hotel room. <laughs> and I was like, iPod dock? What year is this? But then actually they, they literally will put reviews from 12, 13 years ago and uh, just keep them. And those contribute to the score too. Right. So there's a degree of like recency you need to look into as yeah, well. Things yeah. can change in 10, 12 years, yeah. you know. But yeah. Yeah, what a minefield. And uh, the fun thing, and this could be something for, for the listeners to also partake in and, uh, and send in. Uh, my brother showed me this actually last year. Is uh, Stupidly, I had never thought of it. There's Google reviews for everything. Yeah. So you can go into Google Maps and click on the local hospital and <laughs> yeah. see the type of bad reviews that are made exactly. there. Like shocking, you can click on the, the football stadium in the town you're visiting and have there's like complaints about the toilets, you know, not People functioning properly, find, yeah. like how diluted the beer was. There is, it, it is an amazing, like if you're ever, you know, lost for time, stuck in traffic, whatever, mm, mm. flight is delayed, go into Google Maps and click on the most mundane things on the map and scan to the reviews. It's an amazing And sort, sort by worst, you're going to have, you're gonna have a good time. It's fantastic. But sometimes even sort by best because... Mm. There'll be people that were super passionate about their experience at the local skateboard park or yeah, whatever yeah, it may yeah. be, or the local uh, jewelry shop or furniture shop. Like it's 100%. really, uh, 
I mean, yeah. we're closing in on the black future or the black mirror future where we will all have reviews of ourselves, you know, where uh, you and I will be walking around with social sc- social credit scores, I guess you would call it. Yeah. Where I'm a 4.5, you're a 4.8. And if I screw you over or something, you're like, damn, hey, negative social as credit. As long as the podcast is on five stars. That's the main thing. That's you know? the main thing. Yeah. <laughs> Please, listener. You can, can hear. Hide. We're asking. We're really asking now. <laughs> no, we're not desperate. It's we all good. can hide behind that. But I say let's, uh, at some point, maybe next episode, we come back with some of those uh, reviews yeah. because that mundanity is right within our uh, swing zone. Do you know what could be good, actually? If we bring the review, but then make it so you have to guess what the thing is. Is it yes, like a football stadium? Or, yeah, yeah. Okay. We've just sweet, developed sweet, sweet, sweet. more brilliant Another content. IP. Oh, Yet my again. God. Love Jot it. it down. Keep it going. So let's take a quick break. When we come back, listeners, we've got a treat lined up for you. We're going back to the film and TV side, this time discussing film cliches and tropes. Listeners, we are back. I liked how you started with listeners and not ladies and gentlemen. That's a, a more inclusive term. So I'm going to use that too. Listeners. I didn't even realize Yeah, that. you did. Yeah, it was we nice. We would be excluding all the boys and girls and yeah. senior citizens maybe not as well. Not to mention people yeah. who don't identify as either lady or gentleman. Yes, so, yeah. very true. It's actually better. Very so let's true. go listen. Definitely. And we're pretty sure everyone listening is listening. So that's... Right. <laughs> you can't really go wrong. You can't really listen without listening. So yeah, very inclusive. So uh, we're back and it's we're one ready. one of the smartest things you've said all week. Which is saying something. So we are back back here to talk about as mentioned cliches now cliches are an interesting one they're they're the subject of a lot of discussion primarily i would say online on the internet Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. people's tolerance for cliches can really vary and sometimes really uh yeah be quite low let's say i'm okay with cliches in general so before before i hear a little bit from you about what you think on on film cliches tv cliches i thought we might just touch in on what is a cliche and actually where does the word come from because it is obviously french i mean anyone mm-hmm. who reads it go that's probably french but i didn't really know actually what what it would mean and why that that is the, the word for it so i'll just quickly jump into that so the word cliche it's a french term and it actually dates to the early 19th century and at that time when it was first introduced uh, it means to produce or print in stereotype. So basically it's control C, control V before we had, you know, modern terminology for that. It's copy paste basically is what it means. Uh, but what does a stereotype mean? Because uh, I use that word selectively here. I'm not talking about stereotype as we mean it today. It's a physical object, a stereotype. A stereotype at that time was a printing plate that was used to create abundant versions of the same design. So like the printing press that we all know about from the the mm-hmm. uh, Renaissance and the start of the... Gutenberg. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So that was, uh, that was what uh, the stereotype was. Um, printers, when they were using that stereotype, they heard a clicking sound during the process. I'd say, among others, that thing was probably pretty noisy, if I can, yeah. uh, if I can imagine. Uh, but that clicking sound uh, is the French uh, cliché, which is like an onomatopoeic word to mm. click. Okay. And there you go. Cliché was born. There we are. So it's actually quite a, a term, quite based in history and ve- very related to arts and culture or to pop culture even, which is, uh, yeah, all linked to um, to mass production and uh, mm-hmm. how concepts got reused. And now, of course, we it, it means when we see something that we feel like we've probably seen before, whether that's a character type or something that happens in a movie, a plot point, uh, what have you. So before we get into it in any more detail, I was interested to start by just asking, where do you stand on cliches? Well, oftentimes when somebody tells me something, I might react like, oh, that's a cliche, you know? And what I really mean by that, I think is that's a false cliche, right? So Mm, that's a uh, cliche that might have been rooted in reality at one point, but hasn't really moved with the times, right? A common misconception. Exactly. So I don't mean it necessarily when I use it in my colloquial vocabulary as a positive or affirming thing. It's Mm. more as a contrarian thing. Now, having said that, the other approach would be, well, cliches exist for a reason, and Mm -hmm. there are plenty of true-to-form cliches. So we probably should stray away from that cynical view at yeah. all times of the cliche, right? I think that's a great way to start this off, actually, because probably when you read the title of this episode, you might think, oh, the guys are going to dump on cliches for an hour. But no, mm-hmm. actually, we talked about how there are positive cliches. There are ones that we love, actually. Right. And as you see, we'll get into it. There are some that we're big fans of, and then if anything, we'd like to see more of. Yeah. So cliches can be positive, they can be negative, and we'll, we'll get into maybe some examples of that. Absolutely. 
But uh, without further ado, it sounds like you're you're somewhat positive on cliches, or you're you're kind of neutral, neutral. I'm, I'm lukewarm. Mm. You know, are there any that that really just grind your gears straight away? Well, there's, I mean, anything I think which is too based on, let's say, a racial or ethnic stereotype. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you see you see a lot of these, but yeah. and they keep going even though maybe it hasn't moved to the time. Those for me, a lot of them are the ones kind of verging on the mm-hmm. on being a bit lazy, even when we yeah. talk about film and TV when it comes to screenwriting. Right? Yeah, and I, I think actually these days, in 23, any script that comes out now mm-hmm. is much, much less likely to have that kind of racial stereotyping True. as a cliche, but it's hard to avoid it if you go back even 10, 15 years, you're going to see plenty of examples of racial stereotyping all through film and TV. Right. And there's there's other ones. I mean, even, you know, my beloved Martin Scorsese, Mm -hmm. basically Wolf of Wall Street, taking it to one extreme where every single investment banker is an absolute cokehead, right? And there's a satirical aspect, but then Mm -hmm. you're like, okay, was that a bit of a shortcut, you know, Mm -hmm. for for entertainment's sake uh, by, by using those cliches? They exist for a reason. They're rooted in reality. But then, you know, how much do we universalize the cliche, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the question. But I think then, without further ado, let's have a look at not quite cliches, but things that we suspect are on their way to becoming cliches. Yes. Thought this might be a nice way to intro into the topic. So there's a few things I've noticed, trends in film and TV, that I think in five, ten years we're going to look back on and be like, oh, another one, really? Mm. Now, we're not quite there yet, but maybe we're getting there. So the first one and I almost feel bad saying it after the Oscars, is storylines that contain a multiverse of any kind. (laughs) And actually, there's already a lot. Like, I know Everything Everywhere All at Once has kind of mainstreamed it. Right. But there have been many examples. Uh, The Marvel Universe has really gone mad for it. Yeah. And almost everything they release at some point now has a reference to a multiverse of some kind, thanks to Doctor Strange movies. But, like, it's... It's extreme. And already I'm rolling my eyes anytime Marvel talks about multiverses. Yeah, anytime Marvel talks, exactly. for that matter, at this Exactly, point. yeah. I think yeah. We're, everyone's really over the hill on Marvel. <laughs> that could be its own subcategory. Yeah. But also there's that show Rick and Morty, which also yeah. has, has kind of died a death. But that one leans heavily on the whole multiverse thing and, oh, it's me from a different universe and blah, blah, blah. It's a crutch it's using to pull itself back. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And maybe it all comes from how audiences today don't have a high tolerance for like non-scientific magic in, in mm. film and TV, where it's like, oh, he, he's a time traveler. We don't like that, but we do right. like, oh, it's from a multiverse because it like gives it a bit more legitness, you know? Yeah, and and complexity, right? Because yeah. none of us actually have delved deeply enough into the multiverse in the last year and a half since it's gone mainstream exactly. to truly understand it, right? Or even what the hell Zuck is doing at Facebook. Ah, that that complexity kind indeed. of gives it legitimacy, right? In, in pretty much we're tagging verse onto the end of everything now, yes. whether it's meta or multi or what have you, and just saying, ah, it's an AI multiverse. Yeah, and you're just like, okay, cool, yeah. great. That kind of died a death, though, I feel like. The metaverse thing with with, uh, with Mark, I think, is on its way out. I don't think that yeah. got the traction. Oh, no, you're Mark with him. Okay, I call, I call him Zuck, but, you know. Oh, yeah, more on first name terms. But uh, another one, and one I'm I'm quite sick of actually already. COVID references. Oh now, yeah. I, I had it's it's insane how quickly I got tired of this one because we had COVID and we all went to film and TV as a way of kind of dealing with it, you know, of passing the time when we were at home and what have you. And it wasn't long before our film and TV started talking about COVID. Mm-hmm. And there's like humor about it even. Mm. And the the most egregious example I have is Knives Out, the Glass Onion one, where all the characters are masked up at the very start. And they do all these classic things of like, do we elbow or do we, like, yeah. you know, oh, I'll uh, keep my mask on. Yeah. Like, it, and already I'm just like cringing through time as I watch yeah. it. I'm just like, this is absolutely yeah. so dull Lazy, and I don't care. Right? Yeah. yeah, and just like not funny. Yeah, and, like, not funny. A little bit too soon. I'm not being like, you know, all um, angry about it. I just think it, it just isn't funny. Like, it's not a topic with a lot of humor in it. Nor very interesting. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's quite a boring type of apocalypse, mm. in a sense. Yeah. If you want to say, there's not much more to delve into exactly. that we haven't already been inundated by in the last three years through the news. In fact, I think my trigger point on this coming into film and TV was quite low because mm. it's not like everything has had it. That I, most things haven't alluded to COVID. It's kind of True. been like ignored. You're not yeah. having yeah. films with people having masks, etc. Um, but those few things that did it. I was already checked out. Yeah. Right. That's all it took. And I yeah. think it's just like, I don't know. I, if, if you're going to do like a documentary 10 years from now, 
That's one thing, you Maybe. know? Yeah. But that's something totally different. Like, True. In general, actually, even a documentary I would just not watch. I'm like, that topic is so dead to me. I'm like... Yeah, we've really yeah, lived it, right? I had enough. So, yeah, 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 exactly. Maybe for our kids' generation or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, they be. might be interested. Well, they won't be able to sit through even a 30-minute episode of something uh, anymore. TikTok, so. whatever comes after TikTok. <laughs> Jeez, I'm worried. Uh, one more. One more before yeah. we jump into the meat, right? Uh, and we've talked about it on at least two previous episodes, but I thought it was good just to mm. hammer it home one more as it's one that I think we all need to be vigilant for and we need to be critical of when we see it. And that is the tech bro villain in TV and mm-hmm, film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, It's lazy. It's derivative. It's uninteresting. It's obvious. I want it to stop. Can we not find any other villains than a tech bro who founded a company when he was in university? The worst. And, you know, who has like grandiose ideas of how he might save the world, but is going about it the wrong way, has to be stopped. So many, many examples. A lot in superhero mm. movies. We saw Don't Look Up, obviously, with uh, the kind of amalgamation of many different ones. Lex right. Luthor in the newer Batman versus Superman movie was uh, Jesse Eisenberg playing a... Uh, a tech bro once again after right. having played Mark uh, in the social network. Also, Glass Onion. We had Ed Norton playing uh, a yeah. cool, uh, dumb Norton tech people. bro. And yeah. wow, whoa, what a surprise. He turned out to be stupid, you know? <laughs> so, okay. And I did say at the start of the episode, we weren't going to be too negative. And now I'm properly dunking on this. You some, love uh, it, though. Yeah. I, I think there's an aspect there, if I temper your negativity Please a bit, do. maybe, that it is a natural evolution. So there is always, I think, for, for each generation... Uh, there is that evil magnate, whether mm. it was the media mogul at one point that got portrayed in films or uh, the Gordon Geckos, you know, the, the Wall Street side of things or the oil baron, right? Mm. Mm. Now, where the wealth is concentrated and where the companies with the biggest market cap mm. are the tech companies. So I think they come more into the crosshairs when it comes to to making, you know, mm. satire or whatever it may be about the the corporate villain, let's say. Yeah. Now that's the arena, probably. And I, probably the public sentiment is quite negative. Like, I think... Right, absolutely. Gone are the days when we all thought Elon was a badass or we thought Jeff Bezos was super cool, you know? We're, we're kind of seeing these people for what they are now these days. We're very cynical about it and probably our cynicism is, is rooted in, in the right place. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I'm not questioning that. Right. But then it does kind of raise the question of if you were writing a blockbuster right now, where else do you go? I, I know I, I know I did say like, yeah. you know, can we not find another villain? But I think it, we have to go back to, you know, some other rival world power, you know, the head of state of some dictatorial regime or something, you know. Yeah. That I think would be more Get the North Koreans back in. Yeah. Or a fictional, you know, fictional country with uh, yeah. a dictator at the helm. You know, yeah. that, that to me would be more interesting at like least. Like those shows that uh, they say, oh, there's been a revolution in, and they take the name of yeah. an African country and just add East before it. So ah. then they're... So it's like in East Ghana, and then probably nice. 80% of the people watching think East Ghana yeah. is actually a real country. Over their heads, yeah. yeah. It reminds me of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, where they go to <laughs> Bulgaria, which is a fa- phenomenal fun. name for a country. And for years, of course, I thought Bulgaria existed, and I was like, geez, that looks... Uh... Actually, it looked lovely on the film, yeah. other than the child catcher and the overall you know, unpleasantness. Yeah. need to go watch Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, actually. That was, that a... was a definitely a classic. That's, That's a banger. Yeah. What, from the 60s? Yeah. yeah, and Dick Van Dyke, who is still going at age 98 and just got remarried, he's in it. What a chance. As the lead. Unbelievable. Legends of the game, speaking of. Absolutely. But that was, uh, <laughs> I think, just a really interesting uh, broad sweep there through the current trends. So also interested for the listener, if there are any we've missed, any they're sick of seeing already, where they're seeing a lot of trends that they think are already becoming a little yeah. bit cliched. There's others out there for sure, so interested to hear. But without further ado, what I think we should get into is the meat of this episode, which is character cliches in yes. particular. Now, cliches, as you heard at the start, can cover many different things. It can be plot, it can be uh, setting, it can be um, all sorts. You can see I'm, I'm running out of other ones. But in any case, uh, <laughs> what it can also include is characters. And when we were talking about this episode, it seems like the character cliches is actually a super interesting one yep. because with a little bit of research and a little bit of thinking, you can actually find some that are very, very common, but just not immediately obvious. So what I thought we would do is have a go through, we have four here, I think. Yeah, four, five. maybe five. Yeah, five, exactly. Which I think are super funny and, and at least a little bit interesting. Yeah. And I'm interested to hear from you, sir, as to what you, what your take on them is. What do you think? Is it, a, is it a good trope or a bad trope or mm-hmm. a good cliche or a bad cliche? Is it a cliche at all? All of these kind of questions. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Oh, looking for your reflections and I'll, I'll maybe give my own as well with a couple of examples. So 
Does that sound good? Absolutely. Let's go for it. There we go. So let's start with the first one. And this is uh, probably the most abstract one to start with. But I'm going to talk to you about the non-existent antagonist, Ooh. which is a growing trend, I think, in film, although also goes back a long way. Mm-hmm. For anyone who's uh, very confused about what I just said, antagonist, if, if you really don't know, it's um, it means the villain of a film, basically. The, in, in the plot, it's the thing or the person that is like driving the negative conflict against the protagonist the the, protagonist foil exactly yeah however there are many examples of films where there is no antagonist Mm -hmm. and it sounds almost uh strange to think but no there are many so here's a few examples eternal sunshine of the spotless mind Mm. where uh kate winslet and jim carrey are kind of just their own two protagonists who are kind of against each other but also not and yeah you could argue the memory white people are kind of antagonists but they're not really because they're they have no stakes in it you know it's uh it's a little bit confusing. Also a confusing movie. Castaway, where uh, Hanksy finds himself on an island Absolutely. where there is no antagonist there other than, I guess, himself or the island itself, maybe. Or Wilson, his beach ball. Him and Wilson are best buds, though. That's, That's true. Like, Definitely Wilson, not an antagonist. Yeah. I would accept if Wilson had some kind of ulterior motives, then maybe he could be an antagonist. But no, certainly not. And then to stay on the Tom Hanks topic, Forrest Gump. And like I mm. talked about, I think it was in episode one or two, I am not a stan of uh, Forrest Gump. And I think this is partly why, because that film is so uncentered, so scattered, so Mm. all over the place. And it's because I think it's missing an antagonist. Well, I would say Hanksy's character, Forrest Gump, he's basically the device through which we see the second half of 20th century American Mm. history, Mm. right? So it's kind of documentary vibes kind of, yeah. So I I don't know their... Yeah, there's definitely not an an antagonist per se, but I don't mm. think I don't think that film needed one. Of course, we're very divided on mm. on this film. For me, yeah. not that it's a great cinematic exploit by Zemeckis, but mm. maybe it's something that because it was close to me during my childhood, I, I always loved the film. Mm. But mm. I don't think it needs the the antagonist per se. I mean, would that film be better if, for example, there were you tell me more bullying scenes while he's uh, he's a child or whatnot. Like mm. I don't know. Or in the military when he's there, he's I just kind of the hero, right? If if I can offer, and like I have no authority to be doing this at all, but if I could offer my critique, it would be that the character has nothing driving him for a lot of the movie. You know, he's just kind of doing whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes that can be interesting. Um, the Catcher in the Rye, I think, is a great book where uh, Holden Caulfield, you know, spends the whole book doing basically nothing. Right. And that's interesting. But I think for Forrest Gump, I think I'm missing, like, what does he want? What is he What is mm. he trying mm. to do here? Like, what's mm. what's actually going on? And what okay. are the stakes, you know? And maybe that's just me being a little bit simplistic in my needs, you know? But in any case, that's probably what, what I would look to if I was going to try and punch up the script. I would probably look for, like, just something to kind of drive him forward and, like, make him want something. And if that's a slightly more uh, antagonistic character, then so be it. Okay. Okay. Let's see. We'll come back to, at some point in a future episode, I want you to pitch the antagonist of Forrest Gump. Ooh, to so I think that can only end in disaster, but I'm open to it. I'm open to it in any case. But the only point I was going to make here, and there's a few more examples, Into right. the Wild is a good one, but yeah. the, only other, the only point I was going to make is, like, I struggle to think of a movie I absolutely love where there is no antagonist, actually. Mm. If because what if I think of my favorites like No Country for Old Men, Anton Chigur straight away. Yeah, you absolutely, know? a very clear one. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And maybe I'm a sucker for a good antagonist, but like for me, it's it's crucial for mm. for something to have like a a proper conflict. Mm. I think it's an interesting trope because you can still have plenty of conflict mm. without the antagonist. Yeah, and there's different angles to approach it from. So one of them can really be in the person's head. Mm. How much do they get in their way? Or are they imagining things? I mean, think of A Beautiful Mind, for mm-hmm, example. Mm-hmm. John Nash, like, he's just absolutely killing it. But his antagonist is his own kind of mental illness, you know, yeah. schizophrenia, true, I, I think true. it was, right? And that's a brilliant film. True. And right? it reminds me of The Theory of Everything. I mean, Stephen Hawking, where yes. his main antagonist is actually motor neuron disease or like uh, his his uh, his illness, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Here's one for you. Would you put Fight Club in this category? I just thought of it now as we mm. were talking through it. I would say no, because I know that Ed Norton, and spoilers, by the way, for <laughs> Fight Club, but I know that uh, Tyler Durden is not 
uh, is the same person as the narrator, mm-hmm. and we find that out at the very end. But I do think that he serves the role of an antagonist for basically the whole film. Mm-hmm. And it goes from being a, a friend of the protagonist to being an antagonist, yeah. basically. And yeah. he ends up having to kill him, basically. That's you don't the, know when you're yeah. watching it for the first time. Yeah. that So your enjoyment yeah. is not hindered by the fact that okay. we're missing an antagonist, let's yeah. say. Yeah. It is interesting, though. A twist ending is always good. Yeah. Know? So here's another one for you. Another angle from which to approach this one is the characters getting in each other's or their mm. own ways mm. without mm. any need to. And that's what we see every week on Succession. Exactly, exactly. Which is a, obvi- that's a series where you could point to it and say, Logan, obvious antagonist, right? right? But a lot of the time, he's actually just doing his own thing. Yeah. If you and he's not, deeper. Yeah, and he's yeah. not even that interested, really, in what the kids are up to. No. What he has done oh, time and again is just find it the easiest way to mess them up, basically. To yeah. stop whatever they're trying to do and to sell the company to Gojo or whatever. And beyond that, he's like, yeah, you guys do whatever. Like, literally, you're not serious people. Go go do whatever you're interested in. Just yeah. keep it out of my sight, you know? Yeah. So actually, an interesting antagonist in that sense and as you say the main problem with succession especially now this season is the sibs just somehow sabotaging each other either intentionally or unintentionally at every turn exactly exactly that's an interesting one there you go so well, yeah the the absent or the non-existent antagonist thought it was an interesting one it's to very keep interesting i think there's a lot to to dig deeper in there as well exactly exactly but i think we can jump on to another we have a few to to yeah, get through let's do it. and this next one i think wins the the prize for best name of a <laughs> of a cliched character and big shout out to tvtropes.org for these because uh the I lads would have, would have been lost without them they're great for not only the names of these cliches but also linking it a bit to uh yeah what which films are actually mm-hmm. ticking the box right so first and foremost Crouching Moron Hidden Badass is the name of the cliche. Uh, and what this is describing, a bit like a bit like it sounds, uh, this is somebody who on the surface seems like an idiot, but mm-hmm. then becomes magically extremely competent at a key moment in the film. And the classic example, you it almost would merit being called after this character also, is Jar Jar Binks from Star Wars Episode yeah. 1. Yeah. Never to be seen again. Has a bit of a cult following online, Jar Jar. There's a theory, uh, a running fan theory, that Jar Jar is actually the, the Sith lord oh wow okay. uh, and that's indeed. apparently all the signs are there if you go back and watch episode one you know but anyway <laughs> of course they are but if you remember jar jar are key moments in the in the war on naboo he just suddenly becomes really really useful or kind of stumbles his way into being useful so that's yeah. a big one similar one peter in the power of the dog a film we all loved but then instantly forgot about actually uh, yeah. on netflix was a was a netflix was nominated for a couple oscars i think last nominated year. for best yeah. picture yeah yeah i think even picked up a couple of awards yeah along jesse the way. plemons yeah, yeah. Put in a good, uh, good shift. Kirsten Dunst also. Yeah, Benedict Kirsten Cumberbatch, Dunst. not yeah, to be the forgotten. Cumber. Yeah, the but batch, Peter. Man. So the son, Peter, in that film is introduced as a bit of a, not like disabled, but just being a little bit dumb or a little right. bit slow, you know. And then it's only as the film goes on, and again, spoiler warning, but it's as the film goes on. I'll avoid, I'll avoid pure I'll spoilers avoid. here, yeah. where I'll just say, you know, it, it turns out that he's uh, far from dumb and, in fact, quite uh, intelligent. You know. There you go. Uh, another fun example, Waymond in Everything Everywhere All at Once. Very good example. And again, multiverse theory coming into it a bit. And yeah. maybe he's not an idiot in every universe. And that's the explanation. But still, he's introduced as a clumsy, oafy kind of character and then becomes a badass through the movie. And then finally, Pumba in The Lion King. Okay, sure. So Because yeah. Pumba spends the whole movie being a big fat warthog. And yeah. then only in the final little fight scenes where he gets the chance to prove himself against the hyenas, does he actually kick some ass. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think of this trope? I like it. Um, it can be... It is not easy to execute in a creative way, right? Mm-hmm. Let's say. Um, another one going back to Forrest Gump would be Bubba in yeah. Forrest Gump, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That True. would be a classic. He's just talking about shrimps and all of this. Mm-hmm. And then what you realize is this guy was well ahead of the of the shrimping industry and mm, would have made a yeah, killing had, yeah, he, yeah. had he survived Vietnam. In fact, Forrest ends up making that killing for him together with Lieutenant Dan. Damn. Um, another one, Chief in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, yeah. Hadn't thought of that. I haven't guy, seen that movie in a while. Yeah, yeah. The guy pretends to be a dumb, deaf mute mm. and he's got everyone tricked. Just and the right by the end, yeah, spoiler yeah. alert, the movie's from the 70s, so mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. should have seen it by now. Yeah. He's the one that escapes. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, meanwhile, Jack ends up with a frontal lobotomy for yeah. being too smart. Well, and actually, uh, it's Chief that suffocates him with a pillow to put him out of yeah. his misery yeah, right yeah, before yeah, yeah. escape. Which is what he would have wanted. Yeah. We can agree. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. That's a that's a good one. Again, like tackled in a in a different way, right? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. 
somehow even within that universe of the insane asylum mm. you're the first time you see it you're like whoa okay but actually i think that's yeah. one of the best examples it's like gotta be, it's right? super yeah. strong yeah yeah um kind of on this one jake gyllenhaal's character in zodiac mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the 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 cartoon uh writer who then ends up going full on and and finding the zodiac character mm -hmm. and has this kind of hidden detective skills right mm-hmm mm -hmm. Tell me if this one is correct. Jonah Hill and Moneyball? Yeah. Or is that a stretch? That is a bit tricky because he's introduced as socially awkward, for sure. Yes. Low confidence, right? Yeah. But almost from the word go, we're shown that he's super good with numbers. Yeah, you know? that's true. So he doesn't, it doesn't, they, they waste no time in getting him to show how he's a badass, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to really fit into this category, I would have said he needs to spend like 80% of the film bumbling along and mm -hmm. then only in the final crucial moments, you know, prove himself to be a badass. Yeah. Okay. Fair. Fair. Yeah. Because we know right away, hey, this guy's a, a Harvard grad or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that probably kind of. But on the on the Jonah Hill topic, if you think about um, Superbad, I would say yeah. I would say McLovin kind of fits into this category, actually. Yeah. In a very, <laughs> in a very specific way. In a twisted because, teenager type of yeah, way. Yeah. yeah, because he spends the whole film, you know, being mocked and jeered. Yeah. But actually, he turns out to be the most successful of the three. Yeah. When it comes to, uh, yeah, the ladies. McLovin. Absolutely. <laughs> a classic. So we like that one. We like Crouching Moron, Hidden Badass. I, I like uh, Crouching Moron, Hidden Badass. I like the name especially. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably the best thing about it. So yeah, we can uh, yeah. we can jump on. Should I keep rattling on? I mean, you have a list here as well. Do you want to take the baton, or should I just yeah? I mean, rattle on? so we have here the sympathetic inspector antagonist, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And this is very much the you know. So if we have the when we have the antihero, right? So the Tony Sopranos of the world, the Walter Whites, right? Mm -hmm. It's who is you know investigating them, who's trying to to get yeah. them down from from the authority side, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the sympathetic aspect is it's not your classic bad cop, yeah, right? Yeah. And that's what I kind of like about this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. And actually, let's start with that one with Hank from uh, from Breaking Bad. Yeah. Because first, you have to answer the quandary of, is Walter the protagonist or the antagonist of Breaking Bad? Like, is he the is he the, is he he the the main character or is he the villain of the piece, you know? Because pretty much all the way through, he's morally reprehensible and doing basically nothing we can approve of. Yeah, but that's what... Uh, Tony Soprano made a possibility in yeah. TV is yeah. that you are the protagonist as the anti-hero. Mm. So we twistedly are sitting on the couch at home mm. in a way kind of cheering for the bad guy. And that but makes them the yeah. protagonist. Do you find that, say with Walter or with, with Tony, do you ever find yourself watching kind of cheering for them? I wouldn't say cheering, but you d you do have very complex feelings yeah. about the person. Yeah, there's Whereas an, uh, it, an affection yeah. there. Kinda. Yeah, if yeah. they were just yeah. presented as the criminal in the background mm. and you didn't get into their reason for doing things mm. or mm. their their character traits more generally, uh, their relationships, then it would be so much easier to, yeah, we always go for the good guys, right? Yeah. But those yeah. they did those jobs so well that they kind of... Yeah. Or the protagonist, which... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, they get the most screen time. So, of course, awesome. you could argue that. But I think actually Walter does have... Just to get off the topic for a tiny second, Walter does have a moment in season one or two, you know, where he becomes Heisenberg and he gets Tuco or somebody and mm -hmm. he's like, mm -hmm. say my name, you know, that mm -hmm. whole thing. I think that's a moment where you're actually cheering for him. Where he, he someone says you're Heisenberg, and right. then he says you're goddamn right. He's arrived. Yeah, He's a badass. And right? the episode ends on that note. It's like that's cool, you know. But then it's only in season four or five of Breaking Bad where you're like, okay, hold on a sec. This guy is absolutely reprehensible. So anyway, back on the Hank Schrader train. So he's a great example of someone who basically we like all the way through. Although I found him kind of annoying as well. Like just as a, you know, he, he very maybe just his personality would grate on me. Like if I met him in real life. He would very much grate on me as well, probably. Mm, yeah. But I do find him broadly sympathetic, very virtuous kind of a of an antagonist. So he fits mm -hmm. the list, I think. Another one I wanted to, to flag was Raquel Morillo from uh, Casa de Papel. Uh, yes, yes, I got it. Great I only example. saw the first two seasons, but you I can, remember you can her. stop there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it gets worse as it goes on. Okay, but she's a great example because, like, we're cheering for El Profesor and his team of... Uh, of heist merchants. The anti-hero again. Yeah, exactly. Great yeah. example. So I guess, yeah, they go hand in hand yeah, with the anti-hero. Yeah, but Professor, I have to say, is the most likable uh, mm. villain you could ever pick. Like, he's such a great... The actor is fantastic, but also the character is super mm. well written, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. But in any case, Raquel, even before the romantic... Uh, 
kind of side note that that develops uh, it was just such a well-written character you know she had like, a complex backstory she wasn't straightforward but she was like super sympathetic you always cheered for her she was having to fight against the corruption of her own police department in many times so it was like she had many battles to fight and win you know so i thought she was a great example actually That's probably a good show yeah one of my favorite now not a film i've i've seen a lot of uh Catch me if you can. I think yeah. I've seen I've seen bits, but not all of yeah. it. Kind of. But Tom Hanks in that he's a he's an antagonist, right? Yeah, but he's on the on the good side of history. Let's say, mm. right? Yeah. Mm. And so do you, does he so work? Leo is the quote unquote bad guy, yeah. right? In a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we cheer for Leo for sure. In, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what we, what do you how do you think they handled Tom there, or do you think he could have been a bit nastier actually to make the film a bit more compelling? I think it only worked because it was Tom. So yeah. that folksy type of vibe, type mm-hmm. of, you know, I'm going to outwit, outsmart this guy without throwing a chair at him in the interrogation room or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Only because it's Tom Hanks. I, I think don't think anybody true. else could pull it off. I think that's probably true. Yeah. Because otherwise Leo would have just absolutely stolen every scene, right? So you, you need a Titan opposite. Yeah. To go toe to toe, but in, in a very different way than what you would expect. So not mm. the, let's say... Uh, Pacino versus De Niro in Heat. Mm, Definitely not, quite, not that type uh, of life. No, right? no, no, yeah. that's for sure. No, so catch me if you can. Probably an okay example. Mm-hmm. And then I had one as well of a terrible movie, Ocean's 12. I don't know if you saw that, but it's of course. All just of appallingly bad. Like, Is it that bad? You go back, yeah, yeah. because I, uh, I'm i a big fan of Ocean's 11. I've yeah. watched it, like I say, seven or eight times. Uh, great little background movie, you know? Classic. But uh, Catherine Zeta Jones' role in Ocean's Twelve. She comes across very well. She, she mm, does a good job. She's okay. her best with it. I would say she is an, a, a sympathetic inspector antagonist. I just think it's an absolutely awful, awful movie. Yeah. I really have no time for it at all. I gotta go back. It's on or I HBO. Back. They've just added all of them on okay. HBO. So yeah. um, I don't recommend it, but okay. if it, you do, you you know. Yeah. Did you uh, <laughs> did you have any more? Uh, I'm gonna throw back to to one of our favorite series here. The Wire. Mm-hmm. Bunny Colvin and Carver. That's a big one. Yeah. How about Bunny, that? Bunny more Bunny one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Bunny is like flawless, basically as a right. guy. His only character flaw is going outside the rules. You know. Yeah. That he's he's doing things that and he then again, shouldn't. You know. Which is yeah. It's he big. goes by the natural law. Yeah. Uh, Amsterdam of natural police. Natural police. He's good police. Yeah. Carver is a great one though because it's not immediately clear to us really. Exactly. Right? It's only really like when Carver is really forced when he's put in a leadership position he has to make a choice that he chooses to be good you know yeah but it's exactly. a lot through and he he succumbs a bit to uh, temptation throughout season one and two and a little bit of three you know so i think that's a great example actually. yeah yeah that's good so that's the sympathetic inspector antagonist i think it's it's very hit or miss with that one yeah so, not not our favorite actually I, no, it sounds like yeah. definitely not so uh, i got another one for you this is by our friends at uh at film tropes or tv tropes, TV tropes yeah. they call this the defrosting ice queen to me this is also known as the grumpy old man turned reluctant father figure that's category. perfect yeah so i like the i like the specificity here because defrosting ice queen is very broad that covers like basically yeah. everyone who starts off mean and gets nicer to exactly. film. but i like your one because a lot of the examples we've chosen are exactly that which yeah. is grumpy old man turned reluctant <laughs> father figure so yeah, let's go. Let's let's hit it. Yeah, where to start but Clint and Gran Torino. Yeah, that's the classic, isn't it? Yeah. Get off my lawn. For the listener, he's doing the face here and everything. He's squinting at me. Yeah. I said, get off my lawn. I don't want to watch that film again. I feel... Just watch that clip. It's one minute. I, I can, I I can, I can check it out on YouTube, yeah. I think that film uh, is almost good, but just is missing a little bit of... Yeah. yeah a little bit of something. But a great example, right? So yeah. making your whole film basically about it. And that's pretty much all the film has to talk about yeah. or a little bit of racism and a bit of other stuff but mm. basically uh grumpy old man gets nice you yeah, know exactly and who better but clint who, who actually better? personifies it who better yeah. i have to say i think clint is better though when he never gets nice or like when right. he, he maintains his frosty uh, yeah. ex, ex, what's exterior yeah like in million dollar baby he's he's yeah sympathetic and you know um empathetic but he doesn't ever really get like fully warm and cuddly yeah. you know yeah i got you so and, I think, yeah. and then I got another one for you along mm. those lines. Mm. Ooh ha! Yeah, now you've kind of <laughs> lost me because showing another gap in my film history oh, uh, no. catalog. Yeah, haven't seen. Okay, so Al Pacino in Scent of a Woman. He won the Oscar for that role. Wow! And he's the very grumpy former war veteran, blind guy that this uh, this student basically has to 
be the caretaker for for a whole mm. weekend and then they go very much on this journey both physically and 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 mentally mm. and he ends up taking the the kid under his wing and i'm not going to spoil too much because i really want you yeah, to see yeah, this i'll check it out yeah. your man rest in peace pour some out psh ah, as a young okay teenager or maybe he's in his 20s but yeah. he's in the film as well okay damn salt yeah, hundred percent. And it reminds me of Les Antouchab. Uh Don't know if you saw that. The French, of course, uh, many vibe, times. Right? At least seven times I've seen. Feels it. like a little bit of a rip, actually. Yeah, the scent of a woman. But yeah, anyway, could be. There you yeah. go. But executed brilliantly in French. Well, that's a good example. Yeah. You, uh, we have loads of examples, actually. I, I would argue that Mad Max in Fury Road actually falls into this trope the yeah. defrosting ice queen right because mm. from the very start mm. I mean he doesn't say anything in in the whole movie basically right but the whole point of that movie or one of the points of that movie is how he learns to care for others you know or how he sees the the importance of saving others not just himself you know so he goes from being a grunting oafish kind of boorish fellow to by the end at least caring for other people around him like furiosa and the other you know the mothers and that kind of stuff yeah that's a good one so i think it fits yeah and let's not forget joel Joel yeah. from The Last of Us. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, we just finished watching it and it's probably uh, been overtaken by succession a little yeah. bit now in the pop culture uh, zeitgeist. But even still, Joel, both in the game and in the series, was very well played, I think, by starting just very gruff, very uh, cold, frosty. Yeah. Who's this kid? Don't have any time for her. Absolutely. You're on your own, kid. Yeah. And then, of course, over the season, we start to see him opening up, relating back a bit to his uh, his own uh, deceased daughter, etc. Father figure. So there you go. Again, yeah, yeah. grumpy old man becomes reluctant yeah. father figure. And there's a corollary to this one, and that's fodder for probably for a later episode, mm. is the hard-ass coach department, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And this is where we would have the J.K. Simmons character in Whiplash, mm-hmm. although he never really warms up, if I remember correctly. One Does scene, it, yeah. but it's fake. Or it's like right. if when they go to the jazz bar and it's, it's manipulative, like... Yeah, right? yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Kurt Russell in Miracle, uh-huh. the hockey classic. Uh-huh. And Samuel L. Jackson as Coach Carter. You know. These are great. What would you think of the Mighty Ducks? Uh, oh. Emilio Estevez. Is he harsh or does he kind of he he runs a tight ship, but I don't think he's like overly uh I think that one is more I don't know what to call it now, but it's more the redemptive arc of a has been athlete. Mm, mm. Okay. Yeah, he's not he's not grumpy as such. Like he's no, not yeah, no. and he's not old either. He's yeah, kind of exactly. Yeah. Wow. Emilio. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Night at the Roxbury. Absolutely. So yeah, that's uh, Emilio. But then we have our final one, yeah, which is the Eeyore. Tell <laughs> that, me about that. Yeah, that required some explanation. I think when I uh, when I wrote that one down. So Eeyore, for those who may or may not remember, is uh, the grumpy donkey, I guess, from Winnie the Pooh. Mm. Maybe he has different I names. I definitely didn't remember that. Oh, but like you'll remember him when you see him. If you Probably, ever saw Winnie the yeah. Pooh, he's unforgettable. He's okay. the grumpiest little donkey you've ever seen. All right. He uh, is it basically shows signs of severe depression, actually, like uh, throughout the, <laughs> like not, not to put too fine a point on it, but like he is clearly troubled uh, and can only see the, the negative in everything. So what better character to name this, uh, this category after the Eeyore. And we're talking here about characters who are just perennially negative and mm. not even necessarily sarcastic. And although a lot of them are, but definitely with a very dark negative outlook on the world. And I think anyone listening along will probably be able to name a few straight off the top of their head. We have a few here to throw out to start mm-hmm. with. And one I'm a big fan of, and I don't think gets enough respect, is House MD. Yeah, it came before the streaming era. It was, you know, network TV instead of an HBO or something, but yeah. it, it had a huge following back then on the week to week. Yeah, right? and I think you, Laurie put in insane work for it because it, this was his first American accent role which mm, he was yeah. he has said after he was never comfortable he mm. always he always felt he was just one syllable away from messing up the accent you know yeah. so despite how natural he made it seem and he seemed 100% American at least to me uh, that was an example of like where he just completely nailed it and doesn't get the doesn't get the respect he deserves I think and you as a student of accents you know the game I think I find myself talking about a lot actually so maybe it's like um, your go to when you're describing like somebody's acting chops you're like oh and they really pulled off the the American accent I think no I think the reason is I'm just I have such immense respect for when they actually nail it you know because it's so hard to do it properly you know and there are some where you feel you can hear it and it's usually like say it's a it's a British actress going for the American accent and let's say not an A-lister mm. and you can feel by how they uh, 
Finnish a mm, word mm. that there's a bit of a cadence which is yeah. you know a bit off and that yeah. flips back and they the, hit it's even just one letter like they might hit the letter T a bit too hard yeah so exactly. they just say instead of saying like I'm not yeah. they'll say like I'm not I'm not almost, yeah right? exactly and yeah and it's to, already it's a yeah. giveaway you know so anyway big respect also great acting let's not just say the accent it was he did a great job yeah. and then I think an obvious Eeyore at least from parts of it is Kendall from Succession you know gotta be right I mean whole seasons at a time he's a zombie basically all of season two and he becomes yeah. one again towards the end of season three and probably we're gonna have something again in season four i'm finding him pretty eorish almost all the time now yeah like even in this season i mean there's moments of flashes of kind of energy but mostly he's like okay well, let's do it yeah it's okay you know like just kind of odd you know what's but. interesting is that those two that you've mentioned so far there's another red thread between them, which is addiction. Mm, not too, and maybe a little on the nose almost, or yeah, yeah, maybe maybe that's like too simplistic a handling of a complex topic such as addiction, but still, I'm right. with you. That is a, yeah. that is a red Just thread. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. yeah, and maybe there's more here, as we'll see, yeah. because uh, one, I, one I wanted to drop in, which doesn't have an addiction topic, uh, as far as I know, is Toby. Ziegler from the West mm. so somebody who does have a, a heart you know and isn't isn't just a total you know ice queen as we talked about earlier yeah although his outlook and his quips and so forth are definitely on the negative side I mean the guy has almost nothing positive to say unless he really has to Absolutely. and he never smiles exactly right but I do think that uh, Richard Schiff does an amazing job as yeah. I think he absolutely nails it and pretty much everything Richard Schiff does I, I love so uh, yeah. no big respect for that even though the character is a little bit one track I think that's good um now I interpret this one also there is the subcategory of this one which mm. to me is the alcoholic has been writer's blocked allegedly brilliant writer Whoa. <laughs> that's that's broad uh, broad category yeah which I threw out last week right when I was casting mm. Matthew McFadden in my uh, apartheid uh, yeah yeah story yeah. Exactly. right series so here you have Hank Moody played by David Duchovny in mm-hmm. Californication mm-hmm. who when you rewatch that series, he doesn't do anything for seven years. He writes one thing which gets stolen, Ugh. and then he's just writer's blocked and alcoholic, womanizer, yeah. etc. Right? Yeah. We have the Robert Downey Jr. character, if we take the, the newspaper side in Zodiac, right? Mm-hmm. Which is just kind of textbook, right? Uh, we have, of course, famously, Jack Torrance in The Shining, played mm-hmm. by Jack Nicholson, mm-hmm. who is actually very much based on Stephen King's own alcoholism yeah. early on in his Which career. Which he's been open with, yeah, 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 exactly. And the interesting thing on this one, like, is that that's the cliche, right? Alcoholic writer. Mm-hmm. And it's so cliched, true or false, that when you start to type in on Google, why are so many writers? The first thing you get into, like, the, the finishing results is alcoholics well you know what they say i'm not surprised they say right. you should write drunk and edit sober and uh maybe an approach we should try on this podcast <laughs> we've never quite gotten to that level but uh as far as they know we'll keep it in the idea book but a, a great example i love the specificity of it yeah and it is interesting how almost always a writer at some point in any series is depicted as being a little bit uh off the wagon or yeah a little yeah. bit into their into the biz yeah going back to the general ior though i think we're going to see more and more of these tackled in more nuanced and new ways mm. as, you know, let's say talking about mental health and these type of things is coming more uh, into the mainstream and, and less stigmatized, etc. Mm. I think we're going to find new ways to tackle these these types of characters in the future and probably do mm. them in much better ways than just the alcoholic writer. For yeah. Example. In fact, you could argue, say, Sopranos was super ahead of its time wow. for yeah. handling mental health in such a nuanced way because he goes through therapy the whole way through right. the series, you know, which is far more than you would have seen around that time. There was only a couple of other shows, I think, that had such a focus on mental health. In Treatment was one of them. True. Um, but yeah, in, in general, it's like it was handled in a much more kind of simplistic way, I think, back yeah. then. But yeah, I, I'm with you. I think we'll start to see some more interesting portrayals of the many facets of mental health beyond just the usual, I'm sad, you know? Yeah. So yeah, uh, exactly. I'm with you on that. But I like it as a trope. Yeah. I think uh, bring on more Eeyores. Yeah, bring on more Eeyores and bring on more tropes and cliches. So we'd like to come back with new ones listeners write us in which ones are your favorites did we miss anything were Mm. there some examples that we didn't include 
Uh, are there different ways of looking at certain characters? We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we think this topic is ripe for postulation, as are many topics we talk about. But this one in particular, I'd love to hear any ones we missed, especially any uh, any within those categories that we, we actually didn't pick up would be super interesting. Absolutely. Neil, thank you for this session. It's been a pleasure, Nicola Volpe. Absolutely. <laughs>